it took a lot of people investing and working hard and, and believing in, in this place being a winner. And it is. There's that classic picture of Franz Wilhelmsen standing on the top of a rock, kind of pointing at where he wants to put the next run. People around here are constantly looking for action and, and what's next. Don't wait. Let's get out there and do it. It was really a place that had just raw energy. Everybody was a dreamer. If I wasn't a dreamer, I wouldn't come here. The verve for life, I think, is what gets into anybody's blood and soul and keeps them here. There's mountains that are better and there are towns that are better, but there isn't a town-mountain combination like Whistler anywhere in the universe, and that's why you have to live here. Whistler is it's this magical place, and it is what you want it to be. It's what shaped me and made me who I am today. You're nobody unless you come here and prove it. There are so many incredible personalities that have come together and, and being active and being healthy and, you know, making that a priority over work. People really cared about which of the best two mountains in North America was better than the other one, right? They're pretty awesome. Whistler, as it's now known, started in 1960 when a group of Vancouver businessmen, led by Franz Willemsen, ventured north on a mission to find a mountain suitable for hosting the Winter Olympics. After four hours on logging roads, they made it to a sleepy fishing camp known as Alta Lake and spotted what they were looking for. Although the mountain and snowfall were impressive, the idea of hosting a Winter Olympics there in less than a decade was certainly met with some skepticism. The, the 68 bid was preposterous. It was not believable. The Olympics are always based on dreams, and typically, they're not very realistic. Olympics happen in Europe, man. <laughs> It'll happen in North America, in Canada, Vancouver. There was nothing here. We'd have to go to Squamish to do our, our groceries. There was no bank. It was pretty rugged. Mid-60s, late-60s even, it was still a gravel road, three, four hours of driving. But the spirit was there. The spirit for the Olympics was born very early. Though the bid failed in 1964, the group pushed on, and in January 1966, the lift started turning on Whistler Mountain. There were six trails on Whistler, and none of them had been cleared properly. If you couldn't ski moguls, you couldn't ski because there was nothing else but moguls. We have stories about the first year where people come up and they have never skied before. They came up and take one look at the gondola and, uh, and the trails coming down and they turn around back home again. It was an adventure. But everybody was up here to see what this place could give you. Whistler quickly earned a reputation for big vertical and deep powder snow. And it wasn't long before the ski bums arrived. Well, everybody was a ski bum because this place wouldn't pay anybody enough to live here. Back in those days, I think Dag Abbey was the best. He was just a phenomenal skier. I remember watching him jumping off the cornice up in the glacier here, and he just landed and went straight down, just one track. I could still see that. <laughs> oh, he was fabulous. While Dag Abbey was the talk of the valley for the impressive lines he was pioneering both on and off Whistler Mountain, in 1968, another bolt skier arrived, took over the ski school program, and helped to vault Whistler onto the international stage. Jim McConkey has a wide reputation as a high mountain and glacier skier. I got the helicopter skiing going here. I thought this was a good publicity for Whistler because people could come and on a nice day, they could get in the helicopter and go ski the glaciers. Word spread quickly that Whistler was the place to go for adventurous skiers. But with big alpine terrain, also came big avalanche risk. Not wanting to tighten the ropes like the resorts in the US, and with no other precedent to follow, 
a group of Whistler ski patrollers led by mountain manager and tireless visionary Hugh Smythe looked for other solutions. A lot of the stuff was done purely on initiative and creativity. Hugh was the guy that started throwing bombs out of the helicopter. It was pioneering in, you know, in all aspects. The first bomb you throw, that's it, it's heroin. You're, you're addicted. Then they brought in avalanche guns later on. The avalanche gun that was just getting formulated from being a, a baseball thrower. And we were practicing shooting Campbell soup tins until we could figure it all out and let us play with the real stuff, you know, with the live ammo. With the counterculture movement sweeping its way across North America in the late 60s and early 70s, it wasn't long before Whistler established itself as the unofficial capital in southwest British Columbia. It was the patrollers, the people who worked. Then you had, I call them the ski bumps, the ones who were the UIC ski team. Some fabulous skiers here at the time, people like Byron Gracie, Rene Paquette. Well, I think most of these guys were on unemployment insurance. And there was a lot of hippies there in those days. <laughs> but they were harmless. They didn't, they didn't bother anybody. It was a real mess. You can't believe how messy it was. It was hippie time. Smoking pot was more important than working. And, and you're riding up on the chairlift. You could smell the marijuana from the guys up in the chairs in front of you. <laughs> One of my jobs was to try and make sure that everybody had a lift ticket. And I had difficulty getting staff in those days because they all just wanted to ski and lots of parties. The ski bums and the hippies weren't the only thing challenging the management in the early days. Success brought a new set of problems. Whistler became so popular that there'd be lineups almost to the gas station there. But I remember one year, Franz come up with the idea that if, if you hike to mid-terminal, you ski for free. And I said to Franz, Franz, do you know what you're, there's gonna be a, a lot of people do that, they'll hike up. No, nobody's gonna hike up there. And it was just like the Chilkoot Pass. It was just a steady line of people going up, so they had to stop it. <laughs> the eclectic culture of the time manifested itself perfectly in the burgeoning sport of freestyle skiing. It was just a bunch of guys that were free spirit, just wanted to ski together and have a great time. And certainly the, the social aspect was a big part of it because I guess we weren't really disciplined. The different types of people who ski are a show in themselves. Enjoy your own aspects of skiing. There's an exciting rush that always comes, and that should never become routine. Whether it was the hot doggers, racers, or just plain old snow lovers, Whistler was on the map. Established as a year-round resort, it was one of the few places in the world where as much skiing progression happened in the summer as in the winter. By the mid-1970s, a few cracks started to show in Franz Willemsen's dream. Whistler had once again failed on their attempts to host both the 1976 and 1980 Olympics. Hugh Smythe left town, and unbridled development threatened the future of the resort. That's when Al Rain and his wife Nancy Green stepped in with a vision to transform the town's garbage dump into a world-class European-style ski village. There was Al Rain. Brilliant guy with a, a head that could bring structure to deliver what needed to be done. The visionary behind Whistler Village. The village opened in 1980, and at the same time, Hugh Smythe made his return to Whistler, this time at the helm of the new resort across the valley called Blackcomb. I'll tell you, there's some tense moments in this place. Franz, he had vision for Whistler Mountain, but he had absolutely no vision at all for Blackcomb. He, he, he thought it would never happen. Hugh, when he came in, 
It was just such a dynamic change, and so it happened so quickly. While the village and Blackcomb were impressive, it seemed the timing of their completion could not have been worse. When Blackcomb was first built, the 80-81 season, we had a horrendous year. It was very, very warm. There was no snow on the mountain. So you can imagine after spending, you know, three years dreaming, designing, building, and whatever in your very first year out of the box, you have to shut her down. By 1982, the, the wheels came off. The economy went in the tank, interest rates went to 23%, and Whistler Village was in dire straits. As I always say, last person leaving Whistler, please turn out the lights. That's how bad it was. Thankfully, it was a group of fearless Canadian ski racers known as the Crazy Canucks who arrived in Whistler for the World Cup downhill, just when the town and Canadian skiing needed them most. The whole town turned out. They were trying to get Dave Murray down the hill and Dave Irwin and myself. And so there was this whole community effort. We ran the race at Glacier World Cup. Dave came third, I came second. We rolled in the middle of town and the place was just full of people. And uh, that was the closest I ever got to being a rock star. I walked out on the stage, said, you know, you know, you wrestle, you rock. And I was like, rock. It was really an epic day for, for me. I think it was uh, in, in sport in Canada, it was pretty, pretty intense. And for Whistler, it was fun. The following season, the snow returned. And shortly after, the economy came with it. Whistler was back on track. But for Franz Willemsen and the management at Whistler Mountain, their toughest battle yet had just begun. Competing against Hugh was just really tough. Competition between the two mountains was just absolutely fabulous because when Blackham and Whistler started to compete with each other, their service level. <laughs> we didn't have the terrain, we didn't have the number of lifts, and we didn't have 15 years of history. Um, so we had to use every tool that we could come up with. Hugh's serving coffee in the lineup, and then he's serving lemonade, and then he's serving something else. What would make a difference? Let's go out and, you know, at the end of the day and sweep everybody's windshield. We would brainstorm and come up with ideas that either we invented or we stole from some other ski area. They would come up with new signage, and I'd tell her, I said, go look at the signs of Blackcomb, take a photo, and let's see what we can do. Oh, just Blackcomb, we don't want to do this. Just go and do it. Why not? It's working. You know, just do it. I mean, we'd have binoculars out of the office kind of looking, OK, they've got a lineup over there. Like, oh, OK, how many, you know, how are they doing? How busy is it? I'd see the cars going by, going to black call. I mean, on the ground, trying to figure out our parking, and Hugh is flying around in the helicopter organizing parking. Hugh doesn't sleep. Uh, we, we convinced that if he's sleeping, he's thinking of sleep. You know, it was, it was tenacious. He's unmatched. He really is unmatched. They were playing chess and we were playing checkers. It was that simple. The battle for mountain supremacy wasn't only being waged in the boardrooms. Once Blackcomb opened here, people really took sides right away. You were either a Whistler skier or you were a Blackcomb skier. Whistler. I'm a Whistler girl. Dark side, Blackcomb. Blackcomb's my mountain. Blackcomb. Yeah, we called it Cloudcomb. Yeah, we never wanted to go over there. <laughs> It was on the dark side. I was a black home guy, for sure. I, I, to me, black home represented the future, represented where skiing was heading, and, and Whistler was kind of like where skiing was. Black home all seemed a little more instant, corporate, and even the runs, like if I want to get right down to it, you know, the way they cut the runs straight down the front. It just looked like a barcode to me. We were ski racing, we had the Whistler Mountain Ski Club, we had a long history of various races. Meanwhile, over at Blackcomb, they were, it was free, with freestyle, and there was snowboarding, and who thought that was gonna last? They hated us. They were the guys who used to spit at us on the chair, and so it's like, those guys. Blackcomb was everything. Whistler didn't even exist to us. Like, when I had my shop, it was the snowboard shop Blackcomb. We couldn't have cared less about Whistler. It was weird if you, like, dated a kid from the Blackcomb Ski Club when you skied for Whistler. <laughs> I don't think I skied on Blackcomb in the first eight years it was here. 
seems crazy, but <laughs> I was busy. Whistler had lots to offer. After four years of battling toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hugh and Blacko, Franz Willemsen had finally had enough and chose to retire. The following year, Hugh Smythe pulled off his most outrageous move yet. To get that T-bar, I think it was in 85, he, I think, got it from Alberta. Hugh Smythe went to Fortress and stole the T-bar in the middle of the night and moved it over to 7-7, <laughs> what is now 7-7. Regardless of how that T-bar was acquired, it certainly raised the ante in the battle of Whistler versus Blackcomb. After that, it was like, hold on. Over the next several years, Blackcomb would act and Whistler would react, eventually creating one of the most advanced ski lift systems in the world. And it wasn't just mountain operations where Blackcomb was pushing. The marketing department was equally aggressive. In the 80s, it was kind of a place where anything went. It was a very in-your-face, have fun, youthful culture, and it was working for us. It was the place that, that the film crews would come and, and, and do stuff in. It was where Eric Peota and, and Trevor Peterson were kind of pioneering lines off in the spearhead. I mean, it was the place where the front edge of skiing was, was moving forward. And for me, it really got driven home when Greg Stump's crew pulled into town to film License to Thrill. Glenn Plake, Scott Schmidt. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Around that same time, there was a new sport starting to catch on. And while it was banned at Whistler Mountain, Blackcomb's doors were wide open. As usual, it comes down to money. It's like, you know, Blackcomb was hungry. They didn't care what you slid on. When you broke, you don't have the, the luxury to be selective. It's, it's hard to describe how important Blackcomb was to the progression of snowboarding. All the top pros would show up, and that was just this little grom, and it was just like mind-boggling. People were doing the craziest stuff I'd ever seen. Snowboarding pioneers like Craig Kelly, Sean Johnson, and Terry A. Hawkinson were regulars on Blackcomb, but no one had a bigger presence in the early days than Damian Sanders. He's the guy that started modern snowboarding. I mean, people hucking huge off cliffs, that's Damian. He says, I'd drive from California for one hit on the windlet. While most would agree that Damien was the king of the Blackcomb windlet, during one of those sessions, it was a Blackcomb local named Doug Lundgren who would also stamp his name into snowboarding legend. Him and Damien were going all day, just back and forth, who was going bigger, who was going bigger, and you know, before you know it, it's, it's the jump off on the windlet. And I still think probably the best photo ever in snowboarding. It's Doug just hanging in space, and you can see Alex Warburton in the bottom corner just going, Meanwhile, over on Whistler, the locals were steadfast with their support for the mountain, and ski racing dominated the scene. Good form. On February 25th, 1989, a courageous young downhiller who grew up in a cabin under the Creekside Gondola did something that no Canadian had ever done before. Yes! Oh, yes! Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Broad boy for the city! It didn't really matter what side of the Whistler Blackcomb debate you were on. When Rob Boyd won that downhill, it, it really unified the community and, and everyone was behind it. I mean, every person in this town will tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard Rob won that downhill. One of the most amazing moments in Whistler's history, for sure. A local kid and the place was packed. Dave Murray being chairman of that race. Everybody was just so proud. My mom said, Rob, you got stubble on your face, but like this. <laughs> Come on, you got to shave it before you get on the podium. So she hauled me back to the house, which is right across the creek from the finish area. 
scraped my chin down and went back out for the awards. <laughs> it was, I think even the Europeans were happy to see Rob win. You know, I think it was one of those moments where you just felt good. You had a feeling throughout the entire village. Rob Boyd had won the race, as well as the hearts of Whistler locals and Canadians alike. But Hugh Smythe and Blackcomb were winning the resort battle. After teaming up with Joe Hussein and his company Intrawest, Blackcomb was unstoppable. And in 1996, the inevitable finally happened. Well, I think everyone around here was, was pretty nervous when the merge happened. I mean, Whistler and Blackcomb competing against each other you know, led to all this progression. I remember they brought us all into Lapre, the little restaurant, and told us that it was, uh, that this was going on, and I, we cried. It seemed like we were gonna lose something. To a large degree, if you'd really thought about it, any time looking down the, the, the tube, you could see it coming. Suddenly, we were introduced to this whole other group of people that were living this parallel life. Once that door was removed, then it was pretty cool. Fortunately, when Whistler and Blackcomb came together, they actually just fed off each other and got stronger. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of sighs of relief breathes in the year or two after that, that, hey, this place, you know, probably just got better. I kept always thinking, gosh, Whistler has a lot of great stuff. How come I didn't come here earlier? This time, the timing could not have been better. With the economy booming and the interest in snow sports on the rise, the newly formed Whistler Black Home soon found itself rated as the number one resort in North America. It was the perfect place for a group of young skiers known as the New Canadian Air Force to inject some much needed energy back into the aging sport of skiing. Creating twin tip skis so they could go backwards like a snowboard could in the, in the half pipe, in the terrain park, I mean, it was incredible. late 90s literally every week something got done up there for the first time and that was that was really a, a huge driver in the in the progression of the sport once snowboarders started getting their ass kicked on going big by skiers you know, they'd step it up and they'd step it up and it, it, it's hard to even describe how much of a influence that is on the entire ski and snowboard world rather than focusing on each other a united whistler black home was taking on the world more progression was happening at the World Ski and Snowboard Festival in April than most resorts would see in an entire season. In 1998, Ross Repliati brought home the first Olympic gold medal for snowboarding. And with that, a long dormant dream was reignited. Standing in Mountain Square the morning of July 2nd, 2003, it was exciting, it was electric, but there was some anxiety. When Rogue hesitated for what felt to me like a full minute, you could have heard a pin drop. My, my heart was in my mouth. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver. In 2003, when the announcement came, there was, there was a lot of people cheering and absolutely thrilled that we were finally getting the Olympics about time. And a whole another party that was saying, no, we don't need it. Worcester's already big enough. We're on the map. Thanks very much. We don't need the Olympics. Like, no, 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 not now. I was kind of scared at first, not so much about the games, but of all the years leading up to the games. As the Olympics approached, anxieties melted away and more and more people got behind the dream, a dream launched by the Founding Fathers more than 40 years ago. With the game secure, Hugh Smythe set in motion what would be his final and most audacious plan of his career. Vision. I think that's what Hugh is, is really in a league all his own, is he has a vision that who else would have thought of a peak to peak? <laughs> I mean, Everyone in town was kind of like confused, like how are you gonna link the mountains up near the tops? I mean, the, the, the gap, the Fitzsimmons Valley just seemed way too big. And then all of a sudden they showed the plans, you know, like, 
oh my god, they're actually going to put a tower over here on Whistler and a tower over here on Blackcomb, and it's actually going to cross the whole span. And, and that, at the time, I remember thinking, like, well, that's a pretty bold move. And there was a lot of people in town that were skeptical. It was tough sledding. There was, there was a lot of strong opposition inside our own company, too. And rightfully so. With a price tag of over $50 million, the peak to peak seemed like insanity to many in the community. And opponents let Hugh know exactly what they thought. With this harebrained idea, if you're going to spend that much money, why don't you build a whole bunch of lifts and whatever and go, well, you know, we, this, is, this is something that's going to change the, the face of Whistler, from, you know, winter, summer. Despite several major setbacks, including the sale of Intrawest and the economic meltdown, the Peak to Peak opened in style on December 12, 2008. I was on the car when my son Shane did the jump off it. Mr. Blackhole, opening day, let's have some fun. Five, four. They climbed up three. on the roof and they bailed off. Just say, see ya, and away they go. <laughs> Let's call it what it is. It's a game changer. It's not just a transportation system, it's a ride. And when you got to see the looks on people's faces that, you know, maybe even their first time in the mountains as they crossed that, it became very, very clear that the Peak to Peak was a winner. I mean, it, it has really revolutionized not only the way that you use the mountains in the winter, but the whole experience year round here. And the naysayers, I mean, have come up and told me to my face, said, you know what, you were, you, you know, you, this, this works. The peak to peak set three world records for cable lifts the day it opened. But more importantly, it gave Whistler something to show off when the world arrived in 2010. When it really hit home is when, when the, the torch came into town. Of course, the dream comes through. You couldn't not get caught up in it. I remember walking through the village and there was all these bands playing and like people with their medals walking by. And I was like, this, this is pretty cool, actually. It, it gave us a, a sense of pride, you know? It, it's like, all right, we pulled it off. You know, this place was born from an Olympic dream. And to actually see that dream realized after all those years was, was pretty special. Pretty cool to be able to say, hey, I'm from Whistler, and you know, look at us. Look at what this town can do. So many good people stepped up and worked so hard and slept so little for those two weeks. You'd think, wow, this was designed for this. You know, the city fathers that conceived the idea and Al Rain and others, I think that was a crowning, a crowning moment. It certainly was for me. Though the Olympic dream eventually came true, it's unlikely any of the original pioneers could have imagined what Whistler would become in just 50 years. Did they foresee a place where the lifts would turn all year round? Where people would work every day all winter so they could ride every day all summer? And where the biggest event of the year would be witnessed by fans wearing shorts and t-shirts rather than ski jackets? Probably not. There's no doubt that progress has changed these mountains and this valley. But the spirit of the people who call this place home burns as strong as it ever has. You'll find it in the skiers, the snowboarders, Olympians and entrepreneurs, artists, musicians, mountain bikers, and trail runners. And anyone who's ever chased a dream. I'm probably more excited today than I was when I was 20. Just when you think that the progression has gone so far already and like you wonder what's going to be next. There's always the one that's the one step further because that's the nature. Oh, gosh, it blows my mind. It really does. I feel like that's what Whistler has done to the younger generation is offered them opportunity to push themselves. You see all these influences just take over the world and it's just like, yeah, that's Whistler. Growing up here is, is going to be just as special today as it was 30, 
40, we're now up to the fourth generation 50 years ago. So I think, I think the future is extremely bright. Thank you.